<laughs> it's really good. Um, now, our first speaker, his name is Charles Hoskinson, but that really doesn't describe it. If you wanted somebody to build you a cryptocurrency from scratch, it's Charles and his company. He is, uh, he's done many things, um, uh, and he's worked on many projects, including the Ethereum project. Um, but actually, most recently, he's working on a project called the Cardano project, which is here. And a fun fact about Cardano I learned recently is that he's actually named after an Italian mathematician who used his mathematics skills to gain an advantage in gambling, which annoyed some people. So please put your hands together and ask Charles Hoskinson to explain more. Charles Hoskinson. Thank you. See, almost blinded by the light. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Y'all fired up? Yeah. Yeah, you just look really excited. Heavy drinking last night. Okay. Hi, I'm Charles Hoskinson, Chief Executive Officer of Input Output. I never plan these things ahead of time, so this is totally extemporaneous. So we'll just see what happens. It's really bad for my comms director and everybody else, because occasionally I say things I probably shouldn't. But that makes it fun. Okay, so what are we going to talk today about? Let's talk about where this whole collective delusion, this craziness that we're involved in, that is Bitcoin and blockchain, is going. So I've been in the space a very long time, professionally since 2013, but I've been playing around with Bitcoin since 2011. So my very first Bitcoin meetup I went to, three people registered for it. It was in Denver, Colorado. And I showed up and I said, ooh, I want to know more. I read that white paper thing. And there's, I was actually the only person who showed up. The other two did. So I talked to myself about how much I love Bitcoin and how amazing it is. But uh, it's grown now to an international movement. In fact, I helped found Ethereum. I was the first CEO. And I was the guy who made the decision to bring Ethereum here to Switzerland. At the time, there was two countries we were choosing between, Singapore and uh, Switzerland. And we said, well, let's send Mihai and a few guys out to Switzerland. At the time, they were in this flat in Spain with a guy named Amir Taki. Didn't have running water or electricity. And they kind of went like uh, homeless vagabonds here to Zug. And they said, let's see if this is an interesting place. And they liked it so much, I flew out and I lived here for a few months. And we got uh, Ethereum set up. And later it became Crypto Valley. And now we have a huge movement. Anyway, what's the point? So in the beginning, the point was delusion. What's that? Anybody know what collective delusions are? Money. Governments, corporations, religions, these things are collective delusions, and they're very powerful. You get a bunch of people together and you say, X, whatever the heck that means, and they just believe it. And because they believe it, you get something out of it. You believe X, the nation state, ah, then you can go fight a war and people die for it. You believe X, the corporation, people are willing to do business with it and trust it, this abstract entity that doesn't actually exist. Think about this. Chase or Samsung or Wells Fargo. Where, where does that actually live? Where is Chase? Is it, is it over there? No. It's just an abstract concept, yet people are willing to work for it. People are willing to lend it billions of dollars. People are even willing to sue it and hold it liable. That's collective delusion. And money is no different. Many of you have jobs, and you receive payment for those jobs, usually in a national currency, like the Swiss franc or the euro or the dollar. And you accept that, and you think that's worth something because you know that there's other people who believe in it, and therefore you can get products and services with it. You can plan retirement with it. But there's no reason for that to be true. There's nothing special about one currency over another. So the, the first great challenge of cryptocurrencies, and this took about four years, was winning the delusion race. That's what Bitcoin accomplished. It came out, it was worthless. Couldn't even buy pizzas with it. And when you could, you had to buy them for 10,000 Bitcoin. Nobody wanted them, nobody would receive them. There were no marketplaces. In fact, when we first started trading them, we traded them on spreadsheets over the internet. We just say, ah, oh, send me 1,000 Bitcoin, and I'll give you $10. And if you didn't get the Bitcoin, you're like, eh, who cares? Then suddenly 2013 came around, and it got actually valuable. We actually got liquidity. We actually had real markets. There was over a billion dollar capitalization. That was special, that was magical. And here's what happens when a delusion sets in. Then you have differences of opinion. Then you have a desire for utility and use. People say, we like the delusion, but we don't like the implementation. And we would love to be able to do something more than just push value between random people. 
Allison Ball. So the second generation was about programmability. That's what we started here in Switzerland a long time ago in 2014. We said, boy, wouldn't it be nice to model the business relationship between two or more parties and write that down in some sort of programming language, kind of like when JavaScript came to the web browser. And by doing that, we would actually be able to have self-enforcing contracts. We'd actually be able to have strange new financial relationships. Like imagine if you're a car dealer and you lease a car to somebody. Wouldn't it be so cool if they miss a payment, their car doesn't turn on? That's a smart contract. And you can do that. And do you need a third party to enforce it? No, you can just put it on the very same thing that controls your currency. So we went and did that. Everybody thought we were crazy. We got mocked and criticized. And then Ethereum won. And now it's big. And here's what happens when you win. Everybody gets angry with you. And everybody wants to do more. And they say, well, wait a minute here. If CryptoKitties can break the whole network, we don't really have a global scale network now, do we? We need it to scale from thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of users to the millions to the billions. And the other problem is there's too much of a difference of opinion in the world about how these things ought to work. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing being here in Switzerland, having your cell phone, deciding to go on vacation to Germany, crossing the border, and not being able to connect to the Wi-Fi network there because it's a different standard and your device can't talk to it? Interoperability matters. And guess what? We have over 1,000 cryptocurrencies. And they're all floating around. And a lot of them are blind, deaf, and dumb. They can't talk to each other. And when they can't talk to each other, it's a very time-consuming and horrendously expensive proposition. Furthermore, none of them really talk well to the legacy system. You've got credit cards. You've got bank accounts. You have PayPal. How the hell do we talk to them? And what are the metadata and the attribution and the privacy requirements behind that? And the last problem that we are now encumbered with, is I assume you guys know of things like Ethereum Classic, and Bitcoin Cash, and Bitcoin God, and Bitcoin Private, and Bitcoin Unlimited. We've got a lot of those. Well, some of them are cash grabs, and some of them are legitimate governance failures. These are differences of opinion, where Bob wanted X and Alice wanted Y, and they just couldn't get along, so sometimes mommy and daddy have to break up and have a divorce. And sometimes the divorce is amicable, and sometimes it's really messy, and Roger Ver yells at people. That's okay. Welcome to Bitcoin. It's a fun space, especially on Twitter. So, uh, so anyway, we have governance problems, don't we? The who gets to decide and who gets to pay side of the world. So who gets to decide? Decide what? Well, let's say that we've come up with a new consensus protocol. It's super duper awesome. And, uh, let's call it Hashgraph, or whatever the hell you want. And it's going to be amazing, and it's going to change everything. And boy, you can get 100,000 transactions per second. How exactly do you go about replacing the consensus protocol that your existing system has with this new one that's supposedly better? To whom do you ask? Twitter? Reddit? Bitcoin Talk? The developers? Which developers? The ones that like you? The ones that don't like you? The miners, well, they're all getting disintermediated. They're not going to be along with it. The token holders, how do you ask them? How do you go find the guy who owns a Bitcoin? Hey, Bob, I hear you have some Bitcoin. You want Hashgraph? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? It's a governance problem. That's why we have fractures. You can't go build a world economy on a new system when there's no clear way to decide how to change that system. When you have a constitution, inside every good constitution is a way to change it including a description of the people who are eligible to do that. We currently don't have that in the cryptocurrency space. Now, the other thing is you'll see this little word here called ICO, initial coin offering. Pop quiz, what was the first ICO? Does anybody know? Show of hands. Yeah, you in the back. You got it, MasterCoin, how much was it for? No, it was $500,000 in Bitcoin, but it was actually at around $100 Bitcoin. So when it went up to $1,200, JR was like, because he had $6 million suddenly. And he set that up on Bitcoin Talk, had a little forum post, say, here's the Exodus address, send a Bitcoin to it, and suddenly it's all going to work out. Didn't have a business structure. Actually, the private keys were stored on his mom's computer. <laughs> the world has changed a bit, hasn't it? ICOs have become very professional. There's a lot of magic to them now, but they're one-time things. We can use them for project finance, but they're not a perpetual finance mechanism. So year five, year 10, year 15, this is infrastructure. We claim it's on par with TCP IP and all these other magical things. 
who will pay for the maintenance, development, upgrades, and research when the ICO funds run out? This is the other side of governance, the who pays and who decides. Why? Because we have something called the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. People who pay are the people who decide. For example, F Sharp, wonderful programming language. And there's a foundation for it, created by Microsoft. Now, technically it's independent, but I don't think the F Sharp Foundation would be able to say, you know, .NET was great, but we're going to move to the Java Virtual Machine. And Microsoft would say, yeah, that's a great idea. Good luck with funding next year. And they say, you know, maybe on second thought, we'll stick to .NET. Similarly, he who pays the developers usually gets to decide what the developers do. Just that simple. So these are the three grand problems of cryptocurrencies, the scalability problem, the interoperability problem, and the sustainability problem. We have set the collective delusion. We all agree that this stuff is useful, and we're just going to go along with it. Hayek won. Private money's here to stay. Great. We love the idea of the smart contract, and there's this beautiful, blooming field of flowers of different ideas. You have multi-party computation and verified computation and state channels and private networks and not-so-private networks and so forth to compute them. That's great. But we don't really have a clear path forward for how do we achieve these three things? So back in 2015, my company got a contract to try to dream of a solution for these three things. And we said, that sounds great. Let's go do it. It's impossible, but that's what we do. We make the impossible possible. So in terms of scalability, what do you have to do? Well, do we have any examples of scalable protocols? You probably used it. It's called BitTorrent. Why is that scalable? Well, if you download Game of Thrones, you get it really quickly. It's the number one pirated uh, show in the world. If you download Pee Wee's Playhouse, you get it very slowly. Apparently, not as many people like it. Go figure. Great movie. Great show. Well, why does it get faster? Because when people join a torrent swarm, they usually add resources more than they take. So more people, more resources, faster, better performance. That's a really good distributed system. And that's why half billion users. That's why a third of all the internet's traffic is carried by this protocol. It's wildly successful. Now, cryptocurrencies, on the other hand, are not built like this. Currently, they're replicated systems. What does that mean? It means that you have a single pie that sits at a table. And when you add more people, you're adding more chairs around that table. Everybody gets a smaller slice of pie. So the first thing you got to figure out is, how do people bring their own pies? Because everybody has disk space, and everybody has CPUs, and everybody has bandwidth. They have computing devices. There's one right there as he searches Facebook. There's one right over there as that person's tweeting. These are powerful devices, and they're connected to the internet. And they have ample resources to provide, of which you use less than, on average, 5%. And most often, you're not even using it at all. So wouldn't it be so cool is as people join, you gain capabilities? You gain transaction processing capabilities. You gain network capabilities. You get more available disk space for that old blockchain we got to store, ball and chain that keeps history. OK. So that's one thing that we have to do. So then we asked ourselves, well, what's the best way of doing that? And who should be in control of that? So the first thing you have to ask is, what the heck is a blockchain? Anybody know? Is it a pend-only linked list? Is it a DAG? I mean, it's like there wasn't actually a very clear definition. So the first thing we did is we wrote a paper called GKL15. It came out in 2015, and the GKL comes from the authors, Juan Garay, Nico Leonardis, and Agalos Callasas. And basically, they said, this is a secure ledger. And this, these are the properties that that ledger is going to have. Great. And then the first question you ask is, does proof of work create that? Does proof of work give us a secure ledger? And the answer is yes. Great job, Satoshi. Proof of work is awesome. It's damn slow and really expensive, but it gives you a secure ledger. Beautiful. Then the next question you could ask, now that you have a baseline, is what else can give you equivalent levels of security? Paxos, or Algorand, or Snow White, or Casper, or Tendermint, or our personal favorite, Ouroboros, the one we created. So in 2016, we wrote a proof for a protocol called Ouroboros, which is our flavor of proof of stake, where we showed that you can get equivalent security to proof of work. Great. Are we done? No, because I didn't talk at all about practicality. I can build something very secure, but impractical. For example, if you want a secure bank, I can say, oh, well, I'll take your private keys, and I'll go put them in Antarctica in an ice cave somewhere. 
and I won't tell you where. It's a very secure solution. Is it accessible? No. Similarly, it's entirely possible to build great consensus algorithms, which on paper are beautiful, but they're not practical. So then we had to systematically deconstruct every dimension from dynamic corruption to things like the synchronization requirements to things like economic incentives. You know, we had to look at all these little parameters and we wrote a follow-up paper called Ouroboros Praus, which we'll be presenting in Israel next month, where we actually made it practical. Okay. And then scalability, well, the problem with scalability is that you actually have to solve three problems at the same time, not one. So you'll see things like EOS or IOTA and Hashgraph, and they brag about their raw transaction processing capabilities. It's actually not hard to build an algorithm that can give you 100,000 TPS. We see it every day. Google has that, or else the Googleplex wouldn't work. Netflix has it, or else you wouldn't be able to get your movies. Twitter has it, or else you wouldn't be able to tweet. Okay. So the hard part is the trade-off profile. What do you give up? And how do the pieces have to be pulled together for you to be able to run a system like this? And that's what our research line is exploring. As I only have five minutes left, I'd love to go into more detail about the other components of the system, but I'll close with this. When you build something, it's a game of trade-offs and it's a game of balances, and it's a game of accountability. You see, we live in a space, it's kind of like the baronial age of banking, where in absence of regulation, in absence of control systems, it's about faith in the person. If you did banking back in the 19th century, you would say, oh, I trust JP Morgan, or his father, Junius. Those are the guys. Or I trust George Peabody. That's my guy, right? Because that's the only basis upon which you can have faith in people. The hallmark of the project, of the Cardano protocol, of what we're building and how we're putting these things together, is the fact that all of the steps we take are done with peer review. So what does that mean? It means that when I write a paper, it's not trust Charles Hoskinson or Agalosa or any of our guys who have these great degrees from these great universities. It's the fact that we submit that paper to the general cryptographic community, not the cryptocurrency community, the cryptographic community. They've been around a lot longer. And all the things you take for granted, like secure internet transactions and public key cryptography, they invented. And in many cases, the people who invented those things are still alive. And they run conferences at the IACR, the International Association of Cryptological Research. And they have all these great places like Crypto and EuroCrypt and AsiaCrypt. And anyone is free to submit a paper to them. And only 20% get accepted just to go show up. The vast majority are rejected. So all the papers we write, all the solutions we write in terms of scalability and interoperability and sustainability, we write and submit to these venues. And they get in. Ouroboros was accepted at crypto. Ouroboros Prowse was accepted at Eurocrypt, and so forth. Now, what does this mean to the general public? It says, OK, we have independent validation that the claims that I'm making may be right. But the other thing it means is that we've created a competitive situation. Competition is the birth of everything. Because now that I've said something, the entire cryptographic community has an incentive to break that thing because they can write a paper to show what I've done is wrong. And they get just as much academic credit as I got for writing a paper about what I've done is right. That's how you get tenure. That's how you get ahead in life in that system. And I don't have to pay them. Since we wrote Ouroboros, we have over 50 citations. There's been seven papers launched from Ouroboros, including one that's a sharding paper. And guess what? We didn't even talk to the authors. They just wrote it. So there's been critiques. There's been praise. And that's the magic of peer review. It's something that's lacking in our space. We still live in the baronial age of protocols where it's, I trust Vitalik, or I trust Dan, or I trust Charles. And if anything, as we march towards the third generation, I think the thing we have to start looking for is, how do we hold these projects accountable to the claims that they make and to the efforts they're actually trying to achieve? In our view, you have to disintermediate, you have to federate, and you have to use things like peer review. All right, since I'm out of time, I uh, thank you all. And if we have time for questions, I'd love to get them. We do. Please stay there. OK. So I was going to say, try and catch my eye. But our first questioner kind of succeeded before he walked into the room. Would you mind saying who you are? And then please pose, pose your question. Yeah, Vincent Everts, uh, Blockchain Innovation Conference Amsterdam. You have a way to uh, organize that governance. You organize uh, uh, it more in layers. How mm -hmm. will that help us to go from Charles to, I mean, 
if you have scientific papers which are peer reviewed, I don't get a lot of trust to have a practical solution. I think these two are normally totally of opposite. I, I, I think that's you, a misconception. No, let me, let me Go ahead. Okay. One, but to have this setup of layers to make things independent, how will that help to get a government which I will trust in five years when you are on the Bahamas? <laughs> I think I'm going to die of a heart attack before I go to the Bahamas. That's the most likely outcome. I've gained like 40 pounds since I've joined this space. I've gotten fat and old and balding and everything. OK, so you asked a very valid question of how do you set up governance and who's in charge and what parts of the system are they in charge of? So the first mistake you can make architecturally is to bundle everything together. The reality is accounting and computation are different things. We combine them in Ethereum for the sake of simplicity, and it worked pretty well. But the problem is that every time you have an issue with your computation, it also then creates an issue with your accounting system. And the liabilities of your computation go into your accounting system. So the separation of the two is the first step. It's like, what parts can you pull apart into independent systems? Independent meaning maybe separate consensus, maybe separate blockchains, maybe separate people in control. Now, why are the liabilities different? If I'm a miner with Bitcoin, and you send me a transaction, she sends me a transaction and to validate, I have no way of knowing that hers was to buy a coffee and yours was to buy drugs. So from the government's perspective, they say all is the same, it's okay, fungibility wins. But when you're dealing with smart contracts, there will be a way, usually, of distinguishing between his, which is CryptoKitties, and his, which is Silk Road 4.0. And guess what? We have precedent for holding people who run protocols liable. Tor exit nodes, for example, they've been thrown in jail for trafficking child pornography, even though they had nothing to do with it. They were just moving the data and following the protocol blindly. So the validation and execution of smart contracts is much higher liability. There's even a great paper called The Ring of Gyges uh, out of Cornell from Elaine Chi and Aaron Jules, which talks about this in detail and tries to dream up some evil smart contracts that are going to cause us some problems. So first lesson is separation of concerns into independent systems and then being interoperable with many different philosophies and allowing people, if they so desire, to attach their philosophy to your system. Then you're talking about a confederation of ideas instead of a domination of one idea. So it allows people to get along a lot better. Let's say you're just in love with Ethereum-style smart contracts and you don't like what we're doing with Yella or Plutus for Cardano. That's okay. Because what I did is I forked Ethereum and I added that to my system as well. So Cardano will be backward compatible with Ethereum. And whatever Vitalik does, we will keep that. We also have our own way of doing things, but you can do that when you have a separation of concerns. Okay, that's the first step. The second step is you have to then look at the types of voting systems that you can deploy and the types of governance systems you can deploy. Now the Athenians, I just came from Greece and I got to see the Parthenon and all those lovely structures and so forth. They had a lot of experimentation with that, and usually whenever they embraced direct democracy, it resulted in mob rule, and the system fell apart. It wasn't so good. So some form of a representative democracy does tend to make sense. Then the question is, is it representative in terms of blind elections, where you elect somebody and you give them total power to go make decisions for a term, which is how we do it in most republics? Or is it like a delegative democracy, where it's on a case-by-case -case basis? For, so for example, for this collection of decisions, I trust Bob until I don't trust Bob. And for this collection of decisions, I trust Alice until I don't trust Alice. That's called liquid democracy. We think the latter is actually superior and has a lot of good properties. So we've written several papers on that, and they're coming out of Lancaster about how we choose to use that. The last thing I'll mention is the bane of all democratic systems, which is rational ignorance. Does anybody know what rational ignorance is? Well, you could argue that. It's a, a consequence of it. But rational ignorance is where the value of knowing something is less than the time you have to spend to know it. I could become very well informed on Dutch politics. I really could if I spent the time. I could even learn Dutch if I wanted to. But I don't think that's really going to do much for my lifestyle. So I'd invested a huge amount of time to become informed on something where I couldn't even vote. And therefore, I stay totally ignorant on Dutch politics. Similarly, you can look at any favorite issue. You can look at health care. You can look at arms policy. You can look at geopolitics. Or a cryptocurrency, where people have to have an opinion. Like, should we go with a post-quantum signature scheme X or Y? That's a complex topic. Who's informed? How much time would it take to be informed? That's the problem. So rational ignorance is the last thing you have to solve, and it's uh, endemic to all democratic systems. Regrettably, Charles, 
We are running out of time, ah. but I want to say that I want to live in your liquid economy. And uh, as one Dutchman, thank you well for doing this. Please put your hands together for Charles Thank Hoskinson. You. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. We are thinking of moving the steps to the front, but it's fun watching our guests leap off the stage, so I think we'll leave it as it is for the minute.